Welcome to Balancing the Ledger, where tech and finance intersect. I'm Jen Vietchner. And I'm Robert Hackett. And today we're joined by Jalak Jobanpatra, the founding partner of Future Perfect Ventures. Thank you so much for being here, Jalak. Well, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your strategy and your fund. You launched in 2013, and now you're launching a second fund. So what's happening? I've been a VC since 1999 started off investing for Intel out in Silicon Valley uh, during the boom and the bust of uh, the internet. And I thought most US VCs were not looking globally enough for the next wave of technology innovation. Um, and I started digging around what was happening in different places in the world, thinking about bigger trends. So we have six billion people uh, in the world. Uh, only half of those are internet enabled. We have more and more smartphones coming online, which means a lot of data that's being collected. We still have two billion unbanked people around the world, a billion and a half people without identity. And so while I've been excited about what internet and technology has done for many of us, I thought the next wave of technology was going to hit those people who have been underserved uh, by the institutions and technologies that have been created. And in that vein, I went to my first Bitcoin conference just out of curiosity. I was just very intrigued by this whole idea of trusting code versus people. As I began digging in and learning more about the technology powering Bitcoin, I started thinking of all the different applications, keeping our healthcare data secure, um, around banking transactions and doing microtransactions, and was just so excited by the talent and the entrepreneurs I met, and I started investing in, in many of them, um, and uh, built a fund around the thesis of decentralization, blockchain, and data science. You mentioned that you started as a venture capitalist in 1999, which was a crazy year. It was just before the dot-com bubble burst. Right now in crypto, we've entered a winter period. Does it, what are the similarities and differences that you are picking up on between then and now? In the really beginning stages of the ICO boom, I think it was April of 2017, we started seeing the prices of Ethereum and Bitcoin rise. And um, you could just feel the energy. And I remember saying at a conference, this is starting to feel like 1999 in Silicon Valley. And uh, sure enough, uh, a few months later, everybody was ICOing. There was so much speculation and frenzy that was very similar to what happened in the late 90s, right before the, the dot-com crash. It took everybody by surprise, even th those of us in the industry that had been in the industry for several years. Um, just the hockey stick and the level of interest and, and the frenzy, there was at least some regulation in place when we saw the IPOs happening in, in 1999. These companies, while they were early stage, they still were more formed than a lot of the companies that were going through ICOs. Often companies were, were um, ICOing uh, just based on a couple paragraphs on a website and not even a white paper. And it was also way more global. Um, we, we've, because of the internet, have more connectivity than ever before. And the internet didn't exist in its same form in, in the late 90s. It was much slower. So people didn't have access to information and ability to invest very quickly in companies the way they were able to in 2017. Uh, I took a step back from the market at that time and wanted to see it level off because there's nothing in history that's been able to sustain that kind of growth. And um, while technology is unpredictable, humans can be unpredictable, I believe human nature is actually quite predictable and we saw that happen. Now, given the bear market and the amount that prices have come down, there have been some reports that it's also affecting the valuations of some of these private companies mm -hmm. in funds. There was reports that Circle's valuation, which um, was uh, three, over $3 billion or almost $3 billion last May, is now you know, trading on the private market at about 75% discount. Are you seeing that? You know, is that a trend throughout the industry? Are valuations um, you know, really being discounted? Well, we're not an investor in, in Circle, um, and, and so I can't comment on, on that valuation. But what I do know is a lot of companies uh, raised large sums of money last year uh, based on the volumes that they were seeing in, in the liquid crypto markets. And at some point, 
you know, companies uh, were signing up a, a million customers a day or close to a million customers a day. And, and so the valuations were being driven by revenues and profits during a very frothy market. So given how much the volumes have decreased uh, in the last year, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if we are seeing uh, valuations come down on the secondary markets for some of these companies. Now, I think the solid companies and solid management teams, even if they have taken a hit in valuation, will will eventually come out OK, um, because at the end of the day, it's human talent uh, and human capital that is what builds these companies and keeps them um, around for a while. Um, monetary capital can only get you so far. There have been hundreds of cryptocurrency-related hedge funds that have started, especially during the mania and frenzy around uh, investment in Bitcoin and other assets. Mm -hmm. um, they seem now to be pivoting into venture capital, your area. What do you make of this trend? Well, I'm not surprised. Uh, when I started investing in this space, it was another crypto winter. It was 2014 and 15. Silk Road, Mt. Gox had happened. I mean, people thought I was crazy for starting a fund focused on early stage investing in the sector at the time. And there were only a few funds, uh, a handful of funds worldwide doing that. Um, and most, uh, most venture funds stayed away uh, from the market because people thought crypto was dead. People weren't really even talking about underlying blockchain technology. But that's when a lot of these companies that are now at scale were built. And they survived that time period. They're actually very capital efficient. They had to be to survive because they didn't have a lot of choices in terms of capital raising. And so when the growth happened, they were prepared. They had the products in place, they had the technology, people, uh, and, and had enough to attract the people who were in it for the right reasons. And they're thriving. You made a conscious decision early on not to invest directly in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Tell us a little bit about that decision. I mean, what was happening during the initial coin offering craze when mm -hmm. people seemed to just be buying everything they could? During that time, everyone was looking for the next Bitcoin and the next Ethereum. So when everybody starts wanting to follow or replicate, that's when you see this frenzy and, and, and then a lot of the entrepreneurs, they thought this is free money. Why not take advantage of the market and, and take it? And, and what they didn't think about is the fact that they were essentially going public. They had hundreds, thousands of investors around the world who were on Telegram chats and who were emailing them and saying, you know, why isn't the price going up or what's going on? And, and, and so they weren't thinking beyond the short term. The investors weren't, the entrepreneurs weren't, and that's just not what we do in venture. Um, it's all about the long term and long term value creation. So the fund itself does not directly own cryptocurrencies, but did you invest in ICOs or was that something that you considered? I did not invest in ICOs, uh, either personally or through the fund. Um, I uh, did participate in, uh, personally in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptos, but not in the ICO process. And has that turned out to be a good decision? I, I think so. Um, I, I think I was on record uh, at the Ethereal conference in 2017 saying 90 to 95 percent of ICOs back then, <laughs> before the craze, were going to go out of business. And I, we're starting to see that happen um, where development teams are, are splintering. Um, if they've run out of cash, a lot of them hadn't managed their treasuries, so they were still holding ETH. Uh, they had taken money, um, uh, so, so they were exposed uh, uh, financially to the downturn in the crypto markets as well as from a technology standpoint. Um, and, and a lot of my experience investing in, in the internet days informed the decision to stay um, out of uh, the ICO market. I also didn't think as a fiduciary to my LPs it was the, the right uh, use of capital. Mm. Now you get to say I told you so. <laughs> you said it, I didn't. Yeah. Well, Jock, thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Jen Vietchner. And I'm Robert Hackett. For more Balancing the Ledger, come to fortune.com. We'll see you next time. Yeah.